Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our time together this morning from St Luke's Chapel with me, Reverend Amy, and Geoffrey is here with me this morning. We come together, don't we, to worship God. We're, we're separated physically from one another, but we come together to worship, to pray, to reflect on God's word, to bring before him how we are, to bring before him our worship, our adoration, our praise, but also the requests the questions, the fears, the hopes of our hearts. Hopefully you have a service sheet in front of you. If not, jump onto the website www.stlukese16.co.uk That will give you the words you need for our songs and for our responses as we make the most of our time together this morning. I encourage you, perhaps you want to step away from some of the distractions that we might be able to lean in together to what God wants to say to us this morning. We come into the courts of the King, the temple of praise. We come as we are. God loves us as we are. All are welcome in his throne room. And we come not needing to pretend everything's okay, not needing to just put on a happy face and clap our way through the service, but we come from a whole host of different weeks. There'll have been good things and bad things, but we come and bring them before Jesus Christ. I want to read a couple of verses from the Book of Lamentations to begin our time together this morning. Lamentations 3 reads, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Let me pray for us as we start our time together this morning. Lord God, we come together to worship you, to praise you, to adore you. Great is your name in all the earth. New every morning is your faithfulness unto your children. New every morning, new mercy we receive. Lord, we put our hope in you, the God who never leaves us, nor forsakes us, nor disappoints us. Lord, as we come this morning to wait upon you, to praise you, to worship you, to pray, would you speak afresh into our lives? Would you lift our heads to the hope we have in you, to the promises we stand upon? Holy Spirit, would you fill us up afresh? Revive us, refresh us, transform us, encourage us and challenge us, we pray. Move amongst us, Lord Jesus, from wherever it is, we join in our worship this morning. We welcome you, we worship you. Speak, O oh Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin our time together by singing a song of praise. I encourage you to sing out loudly where you are. The hymn of the church. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. The hymn based on the words of Mary when she is asked to bear Jesus as her son. Mary feels overwhelmed. She's unsure of what the future will hold, but she turns to praise the God who has seen her and is with her. The same God we worship this morning. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord.
by my soul the greatness of the Lord. With that we are song of praise this morning as we gather together to worship God. Let me say a welcome again to those of you who have joined in the last couple of months. Great that you're with us this morning, that we're here separated physically but together to worship, united in the work of the Holy Spirit in our praise and in our prayers. Why don't we pray together the words of our opening prayer as it appears in our service sheet. Let's pray. Lord God, you are sovereign over all things. You are great and mighty in power. Be our strength in times of weakness. Uphold us when we are down. Protect us at all times through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Each week at the start of our service, we take this deliberate pause to stop, to reflect back on the past week, to bring to mind that which we wish to say sorry to God for. We know we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. In our words, in our thoughts, in our motivations and in our actions, we all, says scripture, fall short of the glory of God. But we come before a God who doesn't cast us away when we get it wrong, who doesn't chuck us out, but a God who encourages us to come before him, to say sorry, and in that moment, know his forgiveness. How many of us carry around guilt or shame or a fear that if God really knew what I had done, maybe he wouldn't love me? Well, doing confession at the start of our service lets us deal with all of that. Because when we come before God, when we say sorry, we know his forgiveness, new mercy we receive. God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. At a moment or two of stillness, I encourage you to draw in mind what is it you want to say sorry to God. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Let's say our prayer of confession together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Amen. Now God promises us that whenever we seek a new union with him, whenever we repent, then God forgives us. And hear these words that remind us of God's heart towards us. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now as God's forgiven people, we take a moment to celebrate, to sing to a God who forgives us much. We're going to say, God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name.
God who has forgiven us much, but who calls us as his people to be people of forgiveness. We're going to think a little bit about what that looks like in Joseph's story. But first, let me say the set prayer for today, the collect. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and your likeness in all your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know that we are in week five of a series looking at the story of Joseph. I don't know about you, but I have found it really challenging to look at this story afresh. What might God be saying to us as a church through this story? Now, last week, Carol preached on the point of the story where Joseph finds himself in the presence of the brothers. Brothers that hurt him. Brothers that were going to kill him, but who chose instead to sell him into slavery so that they would make a profit. Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt. We know this, we've been looking at this story. And then accused of a crime he didn't commit, ended up in prison. He then, because God had given him this gift to interpret dreams, found himself in front of Pharaoh, telling Pharaoh of what he had dreamt. Revealing himself to be a wise and discerning man, Pharaoh took him out of prison and made him his prime minister to look after Egypt in what were to be seven years of plenty, which were to be followed by seven years of famine. Egypt has lived through the happy years. And then last week we saw, two years into the famine, Joseph's family come from Canaan because they are hungry and in need of food. And last week in the bit of the story that Carol took us through, we saw Joseph engaging in some games to test the characters of the brothers. Now the brothers didn't recognise him. Why would they? It had been 22 years since they had sold their brother into slavery. They didn't expect to ever see him again, never mind in the Prime Minister's house. Where Carol left the story last week, the brothers were having a dinner party at Joseph's house. While that dinner party was going on, Joseph had had one of his servants hide a silver cup in his youngest brother Benjamin's sack. The brothers enjoy the food, they rest overnight, they then go on their journey, only for Joseph, after giving them a short head start, tells his men, they've stolen my cup. Go and catch them up, bring those thieves back to this house. Find out which one of them took the cup. Joseph knows he put the cup in the sack. But this is going to be the test to see if the brothers have changed. Will they abandon their youngest brother for their own safety? Or will they do the right thing? Will Judah, one of the brothers, make good on his promise to his father Jacob that Benjamin was safe with him? Our reading's going to pick up. First, our first reading, Anil is going to read from us as Judah makes a speech in front of Joseph. Thanks, and you This Bible reading is taken from Genesis 44, verse 18 and verses 24 to 34. And Judah went up to him and said, O my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again, buy us a little food, he said, you cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me. And I said, surely he has been torn to pieces and I've never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my grey hairs in evil to Sheol. Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then, as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. 
and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. Your servants became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please let your servants remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. This is the end of the Bible reading. Thanks be to God Almighty. Amen. Thanks, Anil. And now Gifty is going to read for us the next bit of the story, picking up straight away Genesis 45, verses 1 to 15. Our Bible reading is taken from Genesis chapter 45, verse 1 to 15. Joseph was no longer able to control his feelings in front of his servants, so he ordered them all to leave the room. No one else was there with him when Joseph told his brothers who he was. He cried with such loud sob that the Egyptian heard it, and the news was taken to the king's palace. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But when his brothers heard this, they were so terrified that they could not answer. Then Joseph said to them, Please come closer. They did. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be upset or blame yourself because you sold me here. It was really God who sent me ahead of you to save people's life. This is only the second year of famine in the land. There will be five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor reaping. God sent me ahead of you to rescue you in this amazing way and to make sure that you, your you and your descendants survived. So it was not really you who sent me here, but God. He has made me the king's highest official. I am in charge of his whole country. I am the ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him that this is what his son Joseph says. God has made me a ruler of all Egypt. Come to me without delay. You can live in the region called Goshen, where you can be near me. You, your children, your grandchildren, your sheep, your goats, your cattle, and everything else that you have. If you are in Goshen, I can take care of you. There will still be five years of farming, and I do not want you, to, you, your family, and your livestock to starve. Joseph continued, now all of you, and you too, Benjamin, can see that I am really Joseph. Tell my father how powerful I am in, here in Egypt, and tell him about everything that you have seen. Then hurry and bring him here. He threw his hands around his brother Benjamin and began to cry. Benjamin also cried as he hugged him. Then still weeping, he embraced each of his brothers and kissed them. After that, his brothers began to talk with him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Gifty and Anil, for reading for us this next part of the story. We'll unpack it in a few moments together. But before we hear our gospel reading and our sermon, we're going to sing one more time to prepare our hearts. In difficult circumstances, in painful times, where we may have many questions 
around not just the present but the future, what is it that we place our trust and our hope in, in life, in death, in storms, it's in Christ alone that our hope is found, we're going to sing that hymn together, hymn or hope in Christ. gospel reading together. I'm going to read Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 24. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided the property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed pigs. He was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Amen. to you, O oh Christ. If you've been standing, do take your seats. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word for us this day. Thank you that your word is living and breathing. That it is not just words on a page, but words you are speaking into our hearts and our lives. Lord, as we get to this difficult section in Joseph's story, would you open our hearts and our minds to what it is you might want to say to us? What do you want to encourage us in? Where do you want to challenge us? Lord, would you speak? Because your servants are listening. I wonder if you have ever had a surprise party or a gift or a visit from someone before. When you open the door and it's not who you expected to be outside. I know back when I had decided to move to London some 10 years ago, my housemates at university threw me a surprise leaving party and I was just so stunned with shock as I walked into my house and into my living room, the shout of surprise left me physically shaking and I was quite unable to talk for about 20 minutes. Now I know for many of you that might be hard to imagine, but I was stunned into silence. I wonder if you've ever had a surprise gift or delivery, which also left you shocked. Maybe someone you haven't seen in a while turned up and you almost didn't know how to react. Maybe it was someone you haven't been in touch with for a while and it was an emotional reunion. Now some surprises are wonderful but sometimes they can be painful. We can be quite unprepared for them. When we visit a place where a difficult conversation happened or maybe we smell a smell or hear a song that just brings back memories. Sometimes that can be positive and a really special thing. But for all of us, there will also be memories of hard times, of difficult situations, of unkind words or actions of others that still, if we're being honest, send us into a tailspin that still hurts. Probably much more than what we would ever want to admit. Often the negative things spoken over all of us, we know they repeat in our hearts, in our minds. This morning we come to a really key part in Joseph's story. But before we unpack it together this morning, it's important for me to say right from the start that some of this is really challenging. We come to a part of the story that brings to light at least two of the key ideas in our Christian faith. That of forgiveness and that God can turn around any situation, any person, any past and still works all things for good. Now I want to stress right from the start, hear my heart on this. Just because forgiveness is at the heart of our faith, it doesn't mean that it's easy or pain-free, or 
that it's a pass to allow those who have wronged us to get away with whatever they want. So often the doctrine of forgiveness has been abused by those who want to write off their bad behaviour or to make others comply with behaviour or actions that were not okay and will never be okay. Being a Christian does not mean that we have to become a doormat. Actions have consequences. And the doctrine of forgiveness is more than just saying sorry and then allowing the behaviour to keep on happening. Words without action are meaningless. And words seeking forgiveness without repentance or reconciliation are merely a lampshade without any means to bring light from the lamp. Now as we look at some of these ideas today, as Carol stressed a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the abuse of power that happened in Joseph's story, I encourage all of you, this week and next week we're going to be looking at this idea of forgiveness and how we face up to the past. I encourage all of you, if this is striking a note in you, talk with someone. Be it me, be it Carol, our safeguarding lead. We are a church family. We weep with those who weep and we rejoice when it is time to rejoice. But we carry each other in prayer and encouragement when it's easy, but more importantly, when it is difficult. So if you want to talk more about anything I share or that God stirs in your heart, do not hesitate to get in touch. With that in mind, let's jump into Genesis together. What does God want to say to us? Now, as I said before we heard the readings, we pick up the story after the dinner party. And Neil started reading with Judah, pleading to be accepted in exchange for Benjamin, his brother. Whilst they had been eating at the dinner party, Joseph had had his servant put his silver cup in Benjamin, the younger brother's sack. And remember what Carol said last week, Benjamin is now Jacob's favourite son. Jacob had had to be convinced to allow Benjamin to come to Egypt by the other brothers and Judah had promised to look after Benjamin. He had ensured with his life is the price that Benjamin would be safe and would return again. The dinner party ended, the brothers rest overnight and at first light they begin their journey back to Canaan. However, after the head start, Joseph says to his servants, they've stolen the cup, catch them up, bring them back. The servants catch up with the brothers and say, how can you have repaid Joseph's generosity with wickedness? Why have you stolen Joseph's cup? Now the brothers are shocked by this accusation of theft and they begin to make this bold claim. If any silver or gold is found in our sacks then the one who is found with it must die. Their bags are searched and we know that Benjamin is found to have the silver cup. Now the brothers are horrified, they are absolutely devastated. They are escorted back to Joseph's house and where Neil picked up, Judah has stepped forward to plead for Benjamin's release, offering himself in exchange. Judah explains to Joseph that Benjamin is the favourite son because his father had already lost his favourite beforehand. Judah explains he promised his dad that Benjamin would be safe with him. And Judah pleads, please take me and let the boy go home. Please let me be a substitute for the wrong of my brother for the sake of my father, pleads Judah. Now this is a far cry, go back with me to when Judah was speaking in Genesis chapter 37. Remember it was Judah's idea to make the profit by selling Joseph, not just leaving him to die, but actually cashing in on his brother's misery. No thought for what it would mean for the heart of his father. 
But something's changed for Judah. He's had 22 years of living with regret, of hearing Jacob's sorrow at the death of Joseph, and he's willing to take seriously the promise he made to his father that Benjamin was safe in his care. Indeed, Joseph had set up this final silver, silver cup test to see if the brothers really have changed. Are they now honest men? Will they simply abandon Benjamin, daddy's new favourite, and return home without him, regardless of the pain and the hurt that will bring? Or have they learned something from the past? Was the regret and the pain and the guilt they had expressed in the previous chapter more than just words and worries about karma catching them up? And Joseph met with the scene of a pleading Judah can keep the game up no longer. Joseph sends all the Egyptians out of the room and Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Joseph begins to weep. Can you imagine the shock of that reveal? 22 years have passed. Joseph, sold into slavery by these brothers, now stands and rules over them. These brothers that had hurt him, who had sold him for a cheap profit, who cared little for his cries of distress. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be pretty speechless and shocked. The brothers are horrified. They're instantly worried and scared of what will happen next. This brother they had got rid of is now Egypt's second in command, and they are pleading already at his feet. What sort of judgment or payback is Joseph about to dish out? What revenge will he take from what they had done to him 22 years ago? Now some people this week got in touch and asked, why did the brothers not recognise Joseph earlier? Well, let's remember that 22 years have passed. He not only looks older, he's not only dressed and talking like an Egyptian, but they also sold him into slavery. Joseph's rise from chains to prison to prime minister is quite a remarkable story. And yet, what does Joseph do? What are his first words? Not anger, but care. Move closer. He says, not so he can strike them, but that he can embrace them. Notice his first words, not anger and rebuke, but reassurance and care. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. It was not you who sent me here, but God. Three times in this short speech by Joseph, he repeats that it was God who sent him to Egypt. How despite their evil and selfish intentions towards him, God had intervened. God had worked all things for good. The good of thousands and the glory of God. Now Joseph's response is not for revenge but for reconciliation. It's for restoration of relationship. Come close. Don't be afraid. How is dad? Go and get him. Move closer to me here in Egypt that I can provide for you and all of our family. Hug me. It's an emotional roller coaster. There's fear from the brothers, embrace from Joseph. There's lots of weeping and there is much to be talked about. 22 years have passed. Questions have no doubt been pondered. I wonder how often in his prison cell Joseph had imagined this moment and whether in his thoughts he ever thought it could play out like this. Years of hurt, of anger, of imagined conversations with those who have wronged him, of pining for his father and for home. And now recently in these games with his brothers of trying to figure out their intentions, whether they too had been changed by years of hardship and the guilt of their secret. Well, it leads to Judah pleading for Benjamin's release and this big reveal by Joseph. What has God been doing under the surface in all of their lives? What works of transformation 
had taken place. What have regrets and guilt and grief produced in the brothers? And what has Joseph grown to realise about how God is and was always his provider, his companion, and the one working all things out for good, despite how hard and how long the wait had been for this moment. It's a pivotal part of Joseph's story. What might God be saying to each of us this day? Well, firstly, I want to pick up some of what Carol started to unpack last week in Judah's story. What a turnaround this is from the most unlikely of brothers. Indeed, in Joseph's story, Judah speaks three times. First of all, in Genesis 37, he's the one who encourages the sale of Joseph into slavery. Last week, we then saw a much changed Judah pleading with his father Jacob to let Benjamin travel to Egypt. Judah made some big promises to Jacob. My life is a wager for Benjamin's safe return. And today in this third speech, we find Judah making true on his promises to his father. Judah pleads with Joseph, save my father's misery. Accept me in place of Benjamin, that I would spend a lifetime in prison. Judah rather would rather choose slavery than carry the burden of blame or guilt or heartache anymore before his father. Now, on one level, I want us to really grasp this morning that it's never too late to turn it around. It doesn't matter how wrong we've got it in the past. It doesn't matter how far we've wandered from the life that God calls us to. There's always a way back. Now, I purposely read Jesus' story of the prodigal son from Luke's Gospel this morning. A story, no doubt, so familiar to many of us. But let's look afresh briefly at it. Because Jesus tells the story of a father with two sons. And the younger son comes one day to dad and says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me the property that is coming to me when you die now that I might begin living today. And although it grieves his father out of love, the father gives to the son that which he asks for. The son then leaves the father's home, travels to a distant land, and lives recklessly. He wastes all of his money on wild living. And very quickly he finds himself in hard times. No money, no meaningful connections, impoverished, and now in a time of famine, unsure of who or what to turn to. He ends up taking a job on a pig farm. Mm. Let's remember for the Jewish audience originally listening, this is the worst of the worst, the most unclean. It really can't get any more rubbish than this. He's so hungry, the younger son. He even considers eating the pig's food. He's blown everything. He's no money. He's no family. He's now eating pig's food in the dirt. But he comes to his senses. Hey, the workers in my father's field have better than I do now. Even if I've ruined my chances to be my father's boy, let me go back and take a job as a hired servant, a worker in the fields. And so he picks himself up and begins the long journey home, interesting the whole way, practicing the apology speech. Dad, I know I'm not worthy to be your son. I know I've blown it, but please just let me be a servant in your field. He practices the apology the whole way back. But Jesus says, his dad sees him in the distance. He jumps out of his chair. He takes off those slippers and he runs towards his precious boy. He's overjoyed by the sight of the one he thought was gone forever coming back. The father runs towards his boy. He throws his arms out and gathers him into his arms. Notice the son starts to give the apology, but he only gets through the first part because the father cuts him off. 
We need to throw a party. Get him a robe. Get him a ring. Get him some shoes. The one who was lost is now found. The one I thought was dead has come back to me. The one who was gone forever is home. Today, come home. Start the journey back. God doesn't care how far you've wandered off course. He doesn't care how much you think you have blown it. It doesn't matter how wrong you've got in the past. It doesn't matter how wrong you've got it. Even today, take the first steps back. The mistakes of the past, the questions and the pain of the present come home. God doesn't need your perfectly constructed apologies. He just needs to see the first steps. He comes running. All the joys. The one who I thought was gone. The one who was lost is found. You don't need to have it all figured out. Come home. The Father is running towards you with an embrace, with love, with a party. Take the first steps back. Judah had got it so wrong in the past. And yet here he is pleading for Benjamin's life, offering himself in exchange for the freedom of his brother. The good news is that Jesus Christ pleaded on your behalf too. He offered his life in exchange for yours that you might come home and be with your father. Come home, be embraced, make the move, and then we figure out together what happens next. God loves you. He's for you. He's running towards you today. Come home. It's never too late. Transformation is always possible. Look at Judah. But also, let's take stock of what Judah is doing. Because he's doing exactly what he said he would do in his speech to Jacob. When Judah was pleading to let Benjamin come, he made the bold claim, my life in exchange for Benjamin's. And now when Benjamin's return looks unlikely, Judah steps up. Why am I saying this? Because it's so easy to say all the right things, but when it comes to it, are our words empty promises or are we ready to put into action the claims of our mouths? On a Sunday in praise and in worship, we make some pretty big promises to our Heavenly Father. I surrender, I live for your glory, it's all about you Jesus. But then when we're not in church, do our lives mirror what we've said and sung and promised and prayed. Jesus, if you come through for me today, I will give you all my life. If you bless me with this money, I will give it back to you. Do we make good on the promises we make? When God comes through for us, do we come through for God? Do our words align with our thoughts and our actions and our motivations? Because it's easy to say the right things, but do our lives back it up? Do the ways of the world win over our pursuit of God and the ways of holiness? In times of testing, what character is revealed in us? Are we people of the words? Are we people of our words? Are we living out our faith in every part of our life, in every moment? Or if we're honest, are we in danger sometimes of becoming Sunday best kind of Christians? All in on a Sunday morning, but somewhere entirely different the rest of the week. Judah did what he said he would, even though it was going to cost him everything. Do we do as we say we will, as we seek to follow God? But what about Joseph and his response? He's been playing games with his brothers. He's kept his identity secret, despite instantly recognising them. He's set traps to test their character. Are they now honest men? Are they willing to abandon Benjamin? 
Will they grieve Jacob again? Will they just go on with their own lives? When we are under pressure, when times are tough, what is revealed in us? Would we have passed Joseph's tests of character in our lives? Now, Joseph is moved by Judah's speech. He can no longer control his emotions and he reveals to his brothers who he is. There are no signs of anger or hurt. Instead, he offers embrace, reassurance and moves towards reconciliation. Now, we're going to think more about forgiveness and confronting the past next week because there's a final twist in the tale for Joseph's brothers. But I want to just offer a couple of comments today. Because Joseph's invitation to embrace and forgiveness is extraordinary. It's an incredible example of what it means to offer forgiveness, to move towards a future. But it's been years in the making. Now as Christians, we know that we are called to be people of forgiveness. We sang it, didn't we? God has forgiven us much and he calls those who follow him to be people of forgiveness. But... There's a huge difference between an acknowledgement of true repentance and a quick and easily said sorry. The doctrine of forgiveness is not about just accepting and moving on from every sorry at the hands of those who have hurt us. It's not permission to be a doormat. It's not about keeping putting yourself in situations that only lead to negative consequences or more hurt just because a simple sorry is offered. We all know there's a huge difference between quickly saying sorry and the promise and heartfelt plea for forgiveness. Forgiveness is a lifestyle to be embraced, not a word quickly uttered. It's an action, not a phrase. Repentance and transformation is possible, but it's something that is wrestled with. It's not just an empty phrase that when said, can only change things, can only change things if the effort and the heart is put in. We are called, yes, as followers of Jesus to be people who show forgiveness, but forgiveness can only be shown to that which is actually repented of and apologised for. You know, forgiveness is more than just saying sorry. The word we have for forgiveness comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means turning away from. It requires action. Now Joseph sees transformation in his brothers. He heard their whispers amongst themselves. Questions of whether this was the past catching them up. He heard the burden of the guilt. He witnessed the transformation and how they are now making the decisions. He sees them to be changed men and so responds with embrace and not with anger. Responds with reconciliation and not revenge. Now Joseph sees how God has worked all things for good despite his brother's intentions and Joseph offers an invitation to relationship and a shared future together. Now the brothers and Joseph still have some work to do and we'll look at that next week. What does it really mean for them to really deal with the past, for this family to actually move into the future together? But for today, let me ask, who are you harbouring anger towards? Whose forgiveness do you need to seek? Who do you need to pray about how to respond to the hurt that has been imparted on to you? What transformation do you need to experience or see evidence of in order to move forward? What hurt or anger do you need to give over to God in response to the hurts others have given you in order that the past doesn't keep robbing you of your present or your future? What is God bringing to the surface of your heart? What's in your mind this morning? Perhaps for some of us we need to seek God's forgiveness. What conversation do you need to have with your Heavenly Father? Come home. Take the next steps of the journey. Your Heavenly Father longs to embrace you and walk with you today. It wasn't too late for Judah. 
It's never too late for any of us. What transformation has God worked in your life? Where today do you need to know more of his hope, his help, his love, as we surrender more and more to him? What is God revealing to you? What do you need to bring before him in prayer? What heart are you not ready to move past? Where do we need to know God's love and provision and hope as we wrestle with some of what it means to forgive that we can move on and embrace the present and the future? Let me pray. Lord God, this is really tough. We thank you for the forgiveness and the mercy that you have poured out upon our lives. Lord, the times where we have wandered off, where we've mucked up, in our thoughts and our words and our actions. Lord, thank you that you don't write us off or throw us away, but that when you see us coming ready to say sorry, you run towards us. Lord, help those of us who need to take the next steps in our journey home to take them. Give us the courage and the boldness, the humility to hold our hands up and say, we know we got it wrong. Those big promises we made that we couldn't live up to. New every morning is your mercy onto us, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you that you pleaded on our behalf, that you laid down your life that we might know your forgiveness and relationship afresh with our Heavenly Father. Lord, as we reflect on this theme of forgiveness, Lord, would you stir and move our hearts? Lord, if we have played a part in this false teaching around forgiveness, convict our hearts, move us to repentance. When we've used the pressure to forgive people, to write off behaviour that was not acceptable. Convict our hearts, lead us to repentance. Lord, perhaps as we realise that we have been victim to that rubbish teaching, heal our wounds, bind our hearts, give us the courage and the strength to share with others. Lord, you are a God of mercy and of forgiveness. Soften our hearts. Lord, where we are not ready to offer forgiveness, would you show us more of the work that needs done? Would you give us your peace? Would you fill us afresh with your hope and your love that we might come home that we might be transformed, that we might know your loving embrace this morning, I pray. The past hurts. Give us courage and vulnerability and humility before you, Lord God, that in our admittance that it hurts, that we might know your healing and your hope this day. Amen. I'm going to take a moment to respond in song. Who am I that the highest king welcomes me? We've all mucked up at times. We've all gone off track. But if your life is anything like mine's, you have also been wronged by others. Words spoken against you. Experiences where others in their words and actions, in their plans, have worked against you, the works of God. If we're honest, sometimes when we're doubting our own capabilities, we still hear those words, don't we? But we come to a God who does not forsake us or leave us. A God who promises to set us free who the sun sets free is free indeed
Whose children are we? We're children of God's. Because we're chosen, not forsaken. God is for us, not against us. Would we know this song to be the prayer of our hearts? You might want to join with me as we sing this song. You might just want to reflect. Let's worship. uncertain times help us not to fear because you are always with us lord we pray for those who are ill and for those who are in the hospital i pray that they have a speedy recovery continue to strengthen them and their families through these tough times lord sometimes it can be difficult to feel hope remind us that through you anything is possible mm-hmm. lord i pray for those who feel lonely who feel like they cannot bring their problems to anyone who feel like their problems are too small. Remind them that nothing is too small for you. Give them peace and fill them with joy. I pray for all key workers. Continue to give them the strength and the motivation they need to continue. I pray for those who are struggling with school. Continue to be with them and help them through their difficulties. Lord, continue to help us to make the right decisions, decisions that glorify you. Help us to live for you. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ifit, for leading us so beautifully in our prayers this morning. We come to a God for whom nothing is too big and nothing is too small for us to know his loving care in our lives. It's a time in our service where we share a sign of God's peace with one another and invite you with whoever you're with to share a sign of God's peace and to share in our comments your messages of peace for one another. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment to share a sign or a comment of God's peace with one another. Peace be with you, Jeffrey. Peace with you, Remy. Peace be with all of you watching this day. Peace. It is indeed our prayer and our hope that you would know God's peace in your hearts, in your minds, in your homes, in your workplaces, in all times and all things, that we would know that the Lord is the one who renews our strength and who gives to his children the peace that surpasses all understanding. As we prepare our hearts to gather together around this table, we're going to sing once more. Judah pleaded to be accepted in exchange for Benjamin. Jesus pleaded and pleads our case before our Heavenly Father. Jesus, like Judah, offered his life in exchange for ours. We have a Redeemer and his name is Jesus. Precious, love of God, Messiah, mm. Holy One. Let's sing the song of worship together. There is a Redeemer. Jesus, God's own Son.
Jesus, my Redeemer, Messiah, the Lamb of God, the one who intercedes on our behalf, who lays down his life that we might live in his love and freedom this day. We come to the table not because we've got it all right, but because we need a fresh filling up to keep us going in our journey. We just sang of the future destination. One day we will serve and worship our King in glory forever. But on that journey towards our eternal Father's home, we come week by week to be encouraged and nourished, filled up a snack, we might say, to keep us going on the journey of life, the pursuit of holiness. We come not because we must, we can because God invites us to his table all of us whatever we've got wrong in the past whatever our questions in the present are we come to his table of love and peace and hope and welcome come home the cry goes out from the father's table let's pray Lord God we thank you for your love Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit here till the work on earth is done. Holy Spirit, as we come to this table, fill us afresh. Motivate us, inspire us, encourage us, transform us that we might live for your light and your glory in this world. Lord, thank you that you invite us to join in with your rescue plan. Lord, we lay down afresh our lives, our hopes, our finances, our time, our talents, in order to say your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives. Lord, for those who have given money onto you this week, the bank transfers, the envelopes, Lord, would you use the gifts, our tithes, that are given on to you to grow your kingdom here. Lord, we bless the hands of those who have given. Thank you that you invite us to join in with your plan, to play our part in seeing heaven come here. Send us out as we will pray in a moment or two, to live for your work and for your glory. Speak to us afresh in this moment, we pray. Would each receive afresh from you. Amen. Amen. The Lord is here. His, His spirit, spirit is, is with us. us. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them, them to, to the, the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right to give him thanks and praise. praise. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards your world. In love you gave us Jesus, your Son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home to the city where angels sing your praise. We join with them in heaven's song, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched untouchables with love and washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. On the night he was betrayed, he came to the table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body, given for you all.
Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it, and said, This is my blood shed for you all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. To find death, he rose again and is alive with you to plead for us all and the world. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highest. Send your spirit on us now that by these gifts we may feed on Christ with open eyes, hearts set on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your feast in heaven where all of creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Standing at the foot of the cross, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. body of Christ broken for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for us all. Creator. By your gift, the tree of life was set at the heart of the earthly paradise, the bread of life at the heart of your church. May we who have nourished at your table on earth be transformed by the glory of the Saviour's cross and enjoy the delights of eternity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray together. Almighty, Almighty God, Lord, we, we thank, thank you for, for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. As ever, it's the time in our service for notices, and we will be celebrating birthdays. I know at least two, one of which is in the chapel this week. I know you can't get away with it, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's been your birthday this week, please do share it in the comments. And after I've given some notices, we will celebrate the birthdays from the past week together. As you have some time to do that, I have a few notices to share. First of all, um, the notice that our dear brother Victor's funeral is happening this Friday. 
at 1.45. Now, everyone is invited to come to the funeral online. The service will be streamed on St John's Church Stratford's Facebook page. We're really grateful to St John's for allowing us to have the funeral at St John's Church. We know because we meet at a school that funerals are not possible here, but St John's are hosting our brother Victor's funeral and so because this funeral is happening there, it will be on their live stream on Facebook. Now you're probably aware that in the times that we're in there are really tight numbers only allowed at the funeral and that's why the invitation is for everyone to join online. Please do not come to the church unless you have been personally invited by the family. It's really tough. We are all aware that we all might have wanted to come to pay our respects to our beloved Victor. I have been touched, I know the family have been, as I've been sharing with them your comments about the difference, the encouragement that Victor was in so many of your lives. If you're able to join in with the funeral online, and it is the hope next year to have a full memorial service where we will all be able to come and share in that together. So Friday 1.45, St John Stratford Facebook page if you wish to come along online. Bible study is back on Tuesday, 7 till 8 o'clock on Zoom. If you want to come, we'll be unpacking more of Joseph's story together. Why not consider coming along and trying it out? I'm sure you will enjoy it. It's always just lovely to see one another and hear each other's voices as we journey together deeper into Scripture. And let me say, because I've been meaning to say for a couple of weeks, if you have started giving online, thank you so much. But please, we'd love you to fill in a gift aid form in order that we can um, get some money in from uh, the gift aid scheme. So if you've started giving and you haven't filled in a form, do drop me a text. I'll help you figure out how to do that. And also, if you've been saving envelopes at home, do please let me know that we can get them collected and then sent to Sue, our treasurer. We come to God because he invites us to give on to him that we might share in his ministry in this place. Okay, it is time for birthdays. What have you got for me? Oh, you know his birthday yesterday? I'll give you this recipe. Wow, so we have three birthdays to celebrate. It was Cecilia's birthday on Monday. And I had a real, the highlight of my day to phone you Cecilia and send my birthday greetings on Monday. So we're saying happy birthday to Cecilia, to Jeffrey, he thought he was going to get away with it. It was his birthday on Friday and to Yomi, as, uh, whose birthday was yesterday. So let's sing happy birthday to Cecilia, Jeffrey and Yomi. Happy, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cecilia, Jeffrey, and Yomi. Happy birthday to you. May God bless you now. 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 That was lovely singing, Jeffrey. <laughs> Let's pray for those whose birthdays it has been. Lord God, we thank you for Cecilia, for Geoffrey, for Yomi. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed them with another year of life. Lord, we pray in this year ahead that they would know your blessings upon them, that they would know your love, that they would know your peace, your hope. Lord, in the challenges that will come, would you strengthen them? Would they know that you walk with them? Yes. Lord, would you answer the prayers of their hearts? Mm. You know what it is they have been praying about. Lord, would you show them that you are a God who answers prayer? Yes. We pray good health. Yes. We pray for good relationships and working arrangements. Mm. 
But Lord, we pray that they would know you to be their shield in every challenge that comes. And Lord, in this year ahead, would they know more of your love in their lives and what your purposes and plans are for each of them. Lord, give them the boldness and the courage to continue seeking you in every part of their life. Lord, we thank you for each of them. We thank you that they are members of our family here. Lord, draw them close and uphold them in the days to come, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Why don't we pray as we come towards the end of our service together? Why not join me in the words of our closing prayer together? Eternal God, beginning and end, go with us in this week's journey. Shine in our darkness. Open our eyes to all you are doing around us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life you give us in Christ Jesus. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for your love and your hope and your peace. Lord, as we go into another week, would we know your presence with us? Would we know that you are the one who lifts our heads? Would you set our feet on higher ground, we pray, that we would be able to endure the storms and challenges of life? Watch over us and protect us always, Lord Jesus. Be our hope, our anchor, be our peace and our rock and we'll be finding your grace the refuge we need for the days ahead god the holy and strong one who gives power to the powerless mm -hmm. who restores the weary who gives new life to his people give you his peace mm -hmm. the blessing of god almighty father son and holy spirit be among you and remain with you always amen amen we're going to sing our final song of praise. The promise of Jesus' presence with us is our rock and sure foundation. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a privilege to know him, to take to him all of our prayers, to be found at peace in him. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Let us find our solace there. Let's sing this final song of praise together.
So thank you for being with us this morning for our service together. I hope you have a good week ahead, a week in which you know God's presence and his peace with you. As I said at the start of the sermon, if today has brought anything fresh into your mind, then do chat with someone about it, be it me, be it Carol, be it someone you trust. We come to a God who heals our broken hearts, who binds our wounds, who walks with us in the questions and the pains of life. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, in the, the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here and see you again soon. Bye now. Bye.